I'm drinking breakfast this morning. Smoothie or hi, Avdi. <laughs> Welcome to meeting. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. This episode is sponsored by Codeship.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeShip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically for fuss-free, continuous delivery. Check them out at CodeShip.io. Continuous delivery made simple. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery service that goes far beyond letting you do continuous deployment. Snap's first-class support for deployment pipelines lets you push any healthy build to multiple environments automatically and on-demand. This means with Snap, you can deploy your staging environment today, verify it works, and later deploy the exact same build to production. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many, many more. You can also use Snap to push your gems to Ruby Gems. Best of all, setting up your build is simple and intuitive. Try Snap free for 30 days. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 165 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel we have David Brady. Six Rubyists walk into a bar and we apologize for the background noise. Avdi Grimm. Hello from Pennsylvania. James Edward Gray. Don't start yet. I'm not done reading Julia's blog. Saran Yitbarak. Hey everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from WordPress Hell and this week we have a special guest and that's Julia Evans. Estrace, Estrace. <laughs> <laughs> rah, rah, rah. You want to introduce yourself really quick? Sure. I'm Julia. I get really excited on the internet about programming. Excellent. I don't know anyone else who does that. <laughs> I live in Montreal. I do data science. Wait, what? Yeah, we're going to need a definition. You mean, do you like formulate one. hypotheses and conduct experiments? I try, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Is there such a thing as data homeopathy? <laughs> Some people would claim that that's the same as data science. <laughs> <laughs> you take 32 gigs of RAM and you t- set it all to zeros and you turn one bit on and it's super effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, the weird thing is that bits on hard drives actually do have memory. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> you know, I tried putting the magnets on my hard drive and it does not make them run better. <laughs> Well, I, how many people have we not made mad in this opening? Just to be <laughs> <laughs> so, data science, Julia, data science. Can we get a definition? What is data science? What is data science? Um, <laughs> this is something I try very hard to avoid. Um, <laughs> Excellent. I'm, we went straight for the best question. <laughs> yeah. My actual job is some combination of like wrangling Hadoop and like finding out why the databases don't work nice, and like trying to remember how to do statistics. It turns out, Julia, that's actually all of our jobs, no matter <laughs> which part of programming you're in. Nope. I can't refer to any of the stuff that I work on as science because the program I'm working on is, is a sample size of one. Hmm. <laughs> wow. That joke was funnier in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good attempt. Yep. Mandy, can you leave that in the show just so people can hear how dumb I am when you don't edit me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, Julia, we've been reading your blog. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. I mean, the reason that I, I wanted to get you on the show is you have some of the most mind-blowing blog posts about <laughs> systems-level programming that mm-hmm. I've seen in a long time. Thank you. You tried to write a kernel in Rust, didn't you? I did. It was an accident in, in a sense. Like, <laughs> like I, I didn't you actually set out. Wow. Write a <laughs> like I didn't set out trying to write a kernel in Rust. I was just going to write a kernel in C or something. And it was like Thursday night and I was at hacker school and Lindsay Cooper, who has worked on Rust came in and I was like, Hey, Lindsay, you do Rust. I don't know any Rust and I have no reason to use it because I don't do systems programming. Also, I want to write an operating system today. 
And she was like, have you considered that operating systems may be systems programming, Julia? <laughs> um, and so I did it in Rust. Wow. Awesome. This makes me worry that my, how I plan out my day is entirely not hardcore enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we finally out hardcore James Edward Gray. That's right. Okay, so I don't even know, I'm not sure where to start with that, but I don't know, can we start with talking a little bit about Rust and what that is? Sure. So Rust is a programming language from Mozilla, a research programming language right now, which means that it's under fairly heavy development. And its goal is to make like things like memory access harder to screw up. So like if you're writing C++, <laughs> you can like shoot yourself in the foot like three billion different ways because you're managing your own memory. But you also have a lot of power that you don't have otherwise, like in Python, right? So Rust tries to give you the same amount of power that you would have in C++ while making it harder to like screw things up. And it does that through like the type system. Right. So it's got it a lot makes, of like, like different types of, of safe pointers and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Exactly. So it gives you, like, compile time guarantees about, like, the memory safety of your program. And it doesn't have nil, right? Didn't they throw out nil? So, like, it has... You can always write unsafe, like, code in Rust. So you can have null pointers and everything terrible. But you need to explicitly wrap it in an unsafe block. Gotcha. In other words, you have to say, I do solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Exactly. And then you try to do that as little as possible. Most of the code in my kernel was unsafe. I have to say, that's one of my favorite parts, is when you start talking about what you're doing, you're like, okay, in order to write a kernel, you basically can't rely on anything. So therefore, right. you put in this special pragma, you know, no standard stuff, you know, and you're like, and most of Rust language goes away at this point, and you had a list of, like, everything you can't use. It was scary. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was super terrifying, it, but it really helps you understand yeah. how an operating system works when you realize that you've lost your entire world. Mm -hmm. Right. And now you just have to build it back one piece at a time, right? Yeah. And you can build it wrong. Like, I built a malloc that always returns the same pointer. Uh, <laughs> That's sufficient. <laughs> you can so inline like, that. A equals 2. B equals 3. And then now A is three, because there's only one place memory ever gets allocated. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so the entire like, heap fits in one register. It's awesome. Yeah, it's the best. I guess I'll go to the obvious question. Why do this? <laughs> well, so, like, I got to hacker school, and the point of hacker school is to become a better programmer, right? Like, you have three months, and they're like, do whatever you want. And try to come out of it a better programmer than you came in. And I had all these things I wanted to work on. And the kind of metric that I decided on is I wanted to work on, like, the scariest things. And building an nice. operating system is pretty scary. Because, like, how do you even do that? I mean, A, it's impossible. Like, you're never going to finish. Right. So that was why I did it. And then it ended up working out. Like, I learned a billion things. So besides this being an interesting exercise, is anyone actually using your operating system for anything? Oh, no, like, it doesn't compile. Like, nobody can compile it but me. And the reason for that <laughs> is that Rust changes, like, every day. Or it used to. It's it's more stable now. But there would be, like, changes to the syntax of the language, like, every week. So I would try to, like, use some documentation. And it would be wrong, because the language would have changed in the meantime. I have to like, say, I've tried wow. to look at Rust a couple of times. And each time I have... I'll go grab some tutorial, and then, like, on line one, that doesn't work anymore. You know, yeah. it's kind of rough. Yeah, and Steve Klabnik is working on that right now. He has a contract to improve the Rust documentation, which I'm really excited about. But yeah, so I would just go into the IRC channel, complain for hours, and they were super nice. <laughs> <laughs> I would be like, I don't understand strings. I still don't understand strings. I actually still don't understand strings, sorry. And, like... Because Rust strings are really weird. They're like all unicorn strings, which is a bit like strange to think about. And also all of Rust types are terrifying. So, <laughs> but the people in the IRC channel are like delightful and will actually answer your questions. So basically it's that uh, you're all uniting against a common enemy, which is the syntax. Yeah. And the syntax, like the syntax has changed. Like it's almost unrecognizable, I think, since when I did Rust mm -hmm. um, like six months ago. So my Rust operating system compiles with probably like the nightly Rust from December 18th or something. 
<laughs> so if you build instructions, step one, this is the Shaw hash of the version of Rust that you need. <laughs> you need it from 6 p.m. to 7.43 p.m. on December 18th. It's awesome. Yeah, and I actually still have that version of Rust on my computer, so I can do demos. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you're um, locked in now. This, is, this right? is the best works on my machine story ever. <laughs> Um, but I don't think anyone else has ever compiled it, and I don't expect anyone to. And, like, the code is also kind of not interesting, because if you read my blog, that's, like, much more interesting. It really is very interesting. I, I recommend <laughs> this these articles on writing the kernel to anyone. And it was, like, super frustrating. And also, like, nobody, like, not a lot of people at hacker school had a lot of operating system development experience. So I'd have these terrible bugs. Like, I would have this string, and it would disappear it would just be replaced with zeros, and I didn't know why. And I didn't figure this out for, like, a week. And I just had no idea what to do or where to, where to start. And so I read, like, this, like, 20-part article about linkers in an attempt to figure it out. I just spent an entire day reading about linkers in the hopes that I had a linker problem. And then what I did you find out? About linkers. So what did I find out about linkers? This is a really good question. It didn't solve my problem. That was the main thing that I found out. <laughs> 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 It's really upsetting because, like, I thought that I had like all this new knowledge, and it was totally going to help me. Um, but so one thing I learned is that there are different ways to, like, when you call a function. No, I can't explain this. <laughs> <laughs> so was it just three months of being really frustrated? Well, so I worked on the operating system for three weeks, actually. Okay. I did other things for the other nine weeks. I tried to write a TCP stack in Python. Wow. And I, I more or less succeeded. I communicated with Google and got Google.com with my Python TCP stack. After the three weeks of, of operating system, did you feel like whenever you worked in a high-level language, everything was on easy mode now? Yeah, I mean, like, it makes the debugging easier when you can do things like print. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that's really <laughs> handy. <laughs> I wrote all these really terrible printing functions. Though I eventually learned how to use a debugger, which helped a lot. I could actually like run it in an emulator and attach a debugger to my emulator, which was a huge advance that I only learned after like two weeks. Wow. So what was the value of doing these kinds of, you know, in your words, impossible projects in a scenario like the hacker school versus kind of doing it on your own? So hacker school is magical. So like one thing is that you have to actually go. Normally when you're doing things on your own, you don't necessarily do anything. Like, you'll work on a project and then you'll stop because you'll, like, go eat popcorn or something. I don't know. Very true. Um, but at hacker school, like, it's, you have to go every day and come in at 1030 and tell people what you're going to do. There's a lot of accountability, right? And another thing is that you actually get a ton of help from other people. Like, I arrived at hacker school and I didn't know, like, the first thing I did was I wanted to learn about the Linux kernel. Um, and normally I would, like, Google something and kind of get confused. But what I did instead was I ran a workshop on the Linux kernel, and I was like, hey, everyone, we're going to learn about the Linux kernel. Actually, I don't know anything. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is the best you way know to anything? start a workshop ever. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody um, left. Like, everyone stayed and was like, we're going to do this together. Yeah, and people stayed, and people actually knew stuff. So people in, like, the audience <laughs> were like, I have actually done kernel programming. And I was like, okay, like, what is a kernel? Like, I <laughs> Let's that. start at the beginning. <laughs> and then they would explain, and I would write it on the board. And then I learned what a kernel was. And then we we like talked about we talked about things like scheduling and like how might a kernel do scheduling, like process scheduling for how to know like when to swap processes in and out. And we could just talk about whatever we wanted. And there are people who actually knew things in the room, which helped. But to run the workshop, I didn't need to know anything, right? Just had to be a facilitator, right? Yeah. So one really big thing about hacker school is that there are people who know a ton of stuff there who can help you kind of learn whatever you want. I love that. I wish that worked in job interviews. Like you could just go to a company and say, I don't know what the CEO does. Let's just work on it together and I'll write on the board <laughs> and then I'll learn and then I'll do it. That'd be great. Very true. I think job interviews would be better if they were like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that when I um, I went through, I guess you'd call it a fork phase, where I was obsessed with the function fork and learned, you know, basically everything about how operating systems mm -hmm. fork off processes and stuff. I cannot believe how much 
that taught me about computers, just figuring that out, you know, like, right. how do they inherit streams? How do you, you know, change the environment so that the underlying child sees something different, you know, or redirect this so that when you fork off that process, it thinks it's writing to this, but I've actually changed that or, you know, just all kinds of things like that or... You know, even just now you can open your shell and you can be like, what's the parrot process? What's the parrot process? And you can keep going all the way back up until you find the one that its job is to launch processes. You know, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how much I began to understand about computers when I did that. And then, like, understanding stuff about computers makes it easier for you to understand, like, to do, like, regular programming work. Like, you think that, like, spending, like, a month learning about Fork or, or, like, forever learning about Fork might be, like, an academic exercise. But then I found learning stuff like this really useful just in, like, my normal work, which was a really big surprise to me. Can you give any any examples of that? Yeah. So this is basically my whole thing about S-Trace, is I started looking at S-Trace as a way to, like, just, like, understand how, like, the interface between kernel space and user space, because that's what system calls are, right? And S-Trace lets you see all the system calls the process is calling. So I was on the train, like, I was leaving hacker school, and I was on the train from New York to Montreal. And it took, like, 13 hours. So I got really bored. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and, like, the internet was a bit, like, because it was on Amtrak and the internet wasn't the best. So I started just, like, S-Tracing Killall. And I was like, I wonder if I can find out how kill all works by using S-Trace. And I totally could. Like, I looked at the system calls that it called. And what it would do is it would look at slash proc, list everything, and then find the name of each of the processes and see if it matched the thing that you tried to kill. So if you're killing, like, Firefox, it would be like, is this Firefox? Yes, let's kill it. Is this Firefox? No, let's not kill it. And you could see it doing that with S-Trace. That is amazing. We should probably define S-Trace real quick. What is S-Trace? Right. <laughs> and I guess we should maybe also define a system call. <laughs> system calls are, like, Like, when you're going to Google.com, right, on your computer, you might, like, type in things on your computer. Like, like when you type in the URL, you press keys, and those are, like, keyboard interrupts, and then, like, you're interfacing with the kernel there, right? I think that's actually not a system call. That was a bad example. Um, But, like, Chrome will need to open files, right? Um, And opening files is a system call, and it needs to, like, communicate over the network, and there's system calls to communicate over the network. So sort of, like, everything you do with your computer needs to go through system calls, like especially things like I.O., right? Right. Launching processes. Yes. Yeah. Launch, yeah, launching processes is, is a really big one. All and those what, pesky things that change the state of the world. Right. <laughs> Though not things like CPU instructions, which like does change the, the state of the world. Like things like changing re- registers don't go through system calls. So S-Trace lets you see all the system calls your program is calling. So if you want to know what files it's opening and if it's spying on you, you can spy on it. <laughs> with S-Trace and see everything that it's doing without having to know anything about the process. And it can be like a closed source program written in like, I don't know, like Prolog or something. And Which is actually kind of amazing. Right. Um, and just there on your computer if you're using Linux. And I found myself using S-Trace like all the time to debug things. Like on my first day at the, at the job I have now, we were like trying to set something up in Ruby and I really don't know Ruby. Sorry, we were trying to like set up my computer and there was this Ruby script and we were like looking at the Ruby script to see why it was running the wrong SSH command. And then we were like, we could S trace it and see what SSH command it's running without knowing what it does and without reading Ruby code, which made me happy because I was still like, Ruby, how does it even? <laughs> <laughs> That's really awesome, though. So what you did was you S-traced for the, it's like exec, the exec. V- VS, yeah. yeah, or something. And that shows you any time a process spawns another process, right? Yeah. And so you you could see, oh, it's trying to spawn this process. And as part of that, it gave you the arguments to the command, which is what it was trying to spawn, right? Exactly. The thing uh-huh. I loved about that that blog post is you make the comment about, well, let's use S-Trace because when the only tool you have is a hammer, right? But you also made the comment of, I've got a program, it's making an SSH call, it's making the wrong SSH call, or it's doing something that I don't expect. I've got two options. One is I can read the Ruby source code, or mm-hmm. I can just look at it in S-Trace. 
And so many people, the only hammer they have is reading the Ruby source code. Mm. And so your argument of when your only tool is the hammer, you know, when your only tool is two hammers, pick the better <laughs> one of the two. And that's what you do there, which is so great. I mean, it's like, who cares what the Ruby code? Who cares that the program's even mm. in Ruby? We know it's an SSH error. Mm. That's brilliant. I really like it. And like, I've started trying to think, like, think more explicitly about the right approach to debugging. Now, because sometimes the right approach really is to read the code and to understand mm-hmm. the logic. Right. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the, the right approach is to like assume that the person writing the code was like malevolent. <laughs> 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 and I, just I, I pretty much start does. from there. <laughs> Especially if it was me writing the code. <laughs> like a past version of yourself might as well be right. an adversary. Very true. So how do you know what approach to take? That's a good question. I don't think about this in as principled of a way as I would like. I think I like the observing my program approach better because you, in some sense, you have to think less. Like it's less like cognitive load, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're like, what did it do? Okay, that's what it did. And you don't need to keep all the state in your Mm -hmm. head about the program. Yep. So overall, I like it better, but it doesn't always help you. Like there are a lot of things that S-Trace can't tell you. Sometimes it's surprising how often it does, right? Like, I know I, uh, at one point I was writing really complex networking code and I was trying to figure it out and I can't remember what I used. I, I probably threw Wireshark in there or something mm-hmm. to watch the packets yeah. go back and forth. And there were no packets. None. Right. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm not actually talking over a network like I thought I was, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's funny how that can teach you something. Yeah, this is a very, like, incisive tool. Like, it can't lie to you in the way that your brain can when you're trying to reason about your code. Like, if it says it's opening a file, it's definitely opening that file. Right, when you go into debugging mode and you start putting in print statements somewhere because you're trying to prove, this is what I think happens here, right? But Mm -hmm. when you look at those system calls, that's what really happened there. Yeah, yeah. So that's, like, my favorite. And, like, I love that you can look at network, things going over the network. Like, I was trying to understand Hadoop, like, the HDFS, and how, like, the HDFS, like, distributed file system works. And then I started S-tracing the client, and I could see the, like, information going across the, the wire. Um, I loved and, your like, examples on that. There's actually, like, chunks of files, you know, you saw, like, oh, look, there's that chunk of that file that it pulled up. Yeah. And I I think some people are maybe like think more abstractly about programs. I used to think more abstractly about programs, but it become very like concrete. And I'm like, I want to see the data with my eyes. That's an interesting point. What makes you want to understand how the Hadoop distributed file system works? Mostly because it's part of my job. Like I work with HGFS every day and there are things like I use this thing called Impala which is a database on top of HDFS and it crashes sometimes or like hangs. And so Good reliability. I was hoping that if I understood HDFS better, I might be able to like work towards understanding Impala better and like debugging why it crashes. So it's sort of helped, <laughs> but it's hard because like, I, I, I guess like it's hard to understand big systems, right? That you start out not knowing anything about yeah. because there are a lot of moving parts. And well, like, you don't know like which part program. You don't understand which part you don't understand. Yeah. Exactly. So now I at least understand the basics of how HDFS works, which is good. I think that's a great point about thinking more concretely because I have a really bad habit of wanting, I want my programs to sort of live in a perfect platonic ideal world and I want to be able to think through the problems with them. Mm-hmm. And I think I waste a lot of time sometimes trying to think through problems that way instead of just saying, you know what, let's get our hands dirty, let's get concrete and rule some stuff out real quick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it can help you, like, like you have this, like, huge branching, like, decision tree process, and it can help you, like, chop things off quickly. Yeah, yeah you can remove huge areas of search, sort of yeah. problem search space. Yeah, which is really amazing. Another thing which is fun is, like, slash proc and proc fs, because you can find, like, which things are open, like, which files the process has open right now, and then, like, follow them around and find out where they're writing their, like, log files. Even if they're not writing them right now, you can, like, see what they have open. And then if it's a pipe, you can find out what other thing has that pipe open and then follow the pipe. That's an inter- interesting question. Are there any other utilities that you find really useful for this stuff, tracking this stuff down? The main other thing I've used is Slashbrock. I want to use Perf. There's this tool called Perf, which will tell you things like how many CPU instructions your program has executed. 
Oh, that's really cool. Um, and it's really magical. And it'll be like, you have this many L1 cash misses. Wow. Which is amazing. And I, I played with it a bit. I wrote this like really tiny seed program and I tried to optimize it a lot. And during hacker school reunion week. <laughs> We're all back together. Let's go back to the crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it was so um, and it was sort of like a typical hacker school thing where I was like, I'm going to write a database. And then I totally didn't write a database. I just wrote like a hundred line C program and like analyzed it for days and tried to understand how to make it faster. I want to crack it of these question there, other tools that are handy. And the reason I want one is because, and I'm, I'm pretty sure David and I had a, exactly the same experience here. We were discussing before the call. But I read Julia's S-Trace article and was like, that's amazing. I have to do that right now. Uh And then I went to, you know, S-Trace, don't have it on my computer. Can I get it from Homebrew? No. Why? Because S-Trace is a Linux thing and I'm on FreeBSD, which is, you know, what OS X is derived from. So it was like, ah, what do you do? And it turns out there is an answer, which is good news. OS X has D-Trace instead of S-Trace. Uh, and it works slightly differently. I would say maybe in some ways it's more powerful, but it's also kind of complicated and which was kind of a downside. But it turns out there's some tools that sit on top of it that remove the complication and take it back to the ease of use that Julia shows off in her blog posts. So I'll put a link in the show notes to an article that explains those really well. Another one for spying on open files and network traffic and pipes like Julia's just been talking about that I've used for many years is LSOF, L-S-O-F. It's like list of open files or something Mm -hmm. like that. And that one is great. You can just pick a process and it will show you everything it's talking to. And because on Unix, basically everything is a file, then there you go. I also want to learn how to use TCP dump one day, but I find it sort of intimidating. And I don't know how to use it yet. <laughs> so when's the next hacker school reunion? Here. <laughs> 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 what will I do? Just walk in with a soldering iron and just see, <laughs> just see how many people scream. <laughs> Circuit board. People do hardware stuff at hacker school sometimes. Someone hacked the door recently because you had to buzz people in. So they made like a Twilio bot so you could text message it to have it let you in. Oh, cool. Don't tell the IT people that you did that. Oh, they know. (laughs) There's a system. It's secure. (laughs) For anybody who has the phone number, though, right? (laughs) No, your phone number needs to be registered. Oh, okay. That opens from from people who are are registered. Okay. Yeah. It's actually kind of secure. (laughs) But yeah, it was just like a regular phone buzz thing that you buzz someone in with on a phone. So they like put in, now, now there's like an Arduino attached to it. Nice. And the the person who made it, Robert Lord, has this amazing blog post about it. And he was just like, I opened it and I didn't really know what I was doing, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the beautiful thing is when you boil it all down, he spent a couple of weeks figuring out how to build a computer and program it to push a button. <laughs> And yet, if you reduce it to that ridiculous level, you lose the fact of how much triumph you get out of Mm. pushing a button. (laughs) Yeah. And, like, writing programs to interact with real-world things is so satisfying in a way that, like, sending stuff over the network isn't always. It's it's not without its caveats, though. I have to tell this funny story. When I was in Denver recently, I dropped by Boulder RB because I was there on the night they held it. And... um, hung out with them, and they they had this system, much like you're describing, where the door is locked, and they could buzz people in using an app they wrote on the iPad. And they had a camera on it that pointed so you could look and see who was there. And I guess the camera froze at one point, so there were tons of people like (laughs) out there trying to get in, and we're like, no, there's nothing, you know. (laughs) Oops. (laughs) Oh, that's beautiful. You mentioned a while back about uh, earlier in the call that like, like you learn some of these things and you're like, I'll never ever need this bizarre, weird skill again. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you need that skill. Mm -hmm. I could cite dozens of examples, but are there other things that you can share that you're like, I'll never need this, but it's interesting to me. And then you turn around and you find out you're needing it again. I mean, this this is a really trivial example, but like when I started using Linux when I was like 15, um, I did not anticipate that it would be like a huge part of my job. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> like, ten years later. Yeah. I was just like, this seems fun. We we were talking earlier about systems, like, not knowing where the error is coming from. Mm-hmm. And one of my picks on the call, or on the show, a few months ago was for an Ergodox keyboard. And it's an open source keyboard. And one of the keys didn't work. And I, so I, I tore into it. I started like, like trying to decompile the kernel on it. And I finally realized from years and years ago of programming video games, when you would let up off the button on the controller, sometimes the mechanical switch would bounce. And so instead of getting voltage on, voltage off, you'd get voltage on, off, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, off, as it would ring. And I spent probably an hour trying to figure out the software. And finally, I just flipped the keyboard over and there was a diode missing that was to keep it from bouncing. And so just a completely bizarre, like I would never predict that I would need to know about switch diodes. Mm -hmm. And I went out to my garage and I still had a box of diodes from when I was doing electronic stuff. And anyway, I I said I wasn't going to tell one of my stories. I lied. The point of this, though, is that I I have no picks for the end of the show today. I just want everyone to breathe a huge collective sigh of relief anticipating this. But one of the... if I was going to pick something, it would be a book I'm reading right now about how to be, how to be creative all the time. And the answer is to be learning stuff all the time, because then you walk into a weird situation and you go, wait, I know this really bizarre, obscure thing that totally mm-hmm. applies. I was talking to a buddy last night about Inform, you know, the text adventure system. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were talking about that because he's going to take a workshop on it at Strange Loop. I thought, wow, that's unusual, you know? And then I was like, you know, Inform, I think, and playing around with it and TADS, which is similar, I think maybe where I gained an understanding for what DSLs are, you know, like how, you know, you just define these things and then the system takes over and makes things work so you can move room to room or, you know, pick up objects or whatever. And and it's funny how that nowadays I look back and I think, oh, yeah, that's like Inform. <laughs> that's amazing. My my friend Leah Alba from my hacker school batch is actually teaching that workshop at Strange Loop. Oh, wow. Oh, I think one of my favorite things about hacker school was like people like her who like she doesn't identify as a programmer. Like she's like an artist and like a seamstress and a magician, not actually a magician, um, but I think her as a magician. And she was like, I can do better art if I know more about programming. So I'm going to go learn more about programming. Cool. So I can make like amazing interactive cocktail dresses that like. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> sort of in that vein, do you f- ever find that any non-programming disciplines kind of spark your programming creativity? Anger management. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry, you didn't ask me that. <laughs> Like, the interaction between, like, writing and programming has been interesting to me because I find that, like, I learn programming better by writing about it, which surprised me. Like, I didn't know that I wanted to write about programming until I did it by accident every day for, like, 12 weeks. So is that something that you explicitly set out to do? I'm going to I'm gonna write about every day of this? Yeah, but I didn't have, like, any clear concept of what it would, like, turn into or what it would look like. I was like, I should just write about this so that I remember what I did and, like, so that my friends at home can know. That always turns out to be, like, the best blog post, though. Whenever I write a blog post that's like, I'm doing this so that when I Google it six months from now, I'll actually hit this. Mm -hmm. You know, and then those are the articles I return to again and again, because it's like I wrote that down to get it out of my head so that Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it forever and ever. And now I just have like a bookmark in my head that's like, oh, yeah, I've got a blog post about that, you know, Mm -hmm. and I can go check that when I need it. Yeah. And it helps like you not worry about the audience for your blog post if the audience is literally just you. Right. Who, yeah. If, if other people are getting stuff out of this, great. But who cares? I am, you know. Yeah. And then, like, one of my friends would be like, nice blog post, Julia. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, <laughs> it is acceptable. This is on the internet. I won't die. <laughs> I have a problem where I don't do enough things that aren't programming right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I go biking, but that's, like, not related. It gives you time to think about programming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> David Heinemeyer Hansen recently drew uh, connections between programming and writing as well. 
saying that he feels like, you know, in writing, we're trying to be clear for our audience or whatever, and that he feels that's how we should treat our programming as well, that mm-hmm. we're, when we're coding, we're trying to be clear for our audience. So this is something that I find interesting because, like, when you write a program, you start out trying to write it in a very clear way, and then it acquires bugs, and then you fix the bugs, and it sort of gets, like... Wait, this never happens. Over time, and it's not clear to me if there's a way to fix that. Yes, because like at program. first you think that the like like logic that you're trying to communicate is like clear and elegant, but then it turns out that it's like complicated and terrible. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I want to do this, except in this case, and also this other case, and then there's this other edge case that I didn't think about. There's this terrific line, and I think it's small talk best practice patterns where it says something about programming is having this idea of what you want to do and then starting to do it. And that changes your idea of what you want to do because of what's possible and, and how things work. Like you say, you know, bugs crop up and edge cases you have to handle and stuff. And then basically rinse, repeat. So now you have this new idea of what you want to do and you try to do that. And that changes the idea about what you want to do. And mm-hmm. But yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess, like, right now, when I write programs for other people to use, they're small enough that I'll just, like, write something and be like, okay, what if I wrote this? Would this be useful? And try not to make it nice, but, like, try to make it something that I can change. A lot of times, especially when I'm out of my depth, I have to write it a few times before I even know how I could reasonably structure it. You know? Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I'll get halfway through it and be like, Oh, yeah, that's why you can't think about this problem like this. Yeah, Yeah, because you're wrong. I think it was Alan Perlis that said, you cannot proceed from the informal to the formal via formal means. I like that. So sometimes there's things that, you know, like we don't understand them. And there's no formal way to solve this problem. All you can do, it's... <laughs> okay, I have to tell a story from my childhood. I had a half-sister who lived with us for a year, and we explained to her that one of the ways that you tell if spaghetti is done is the wall test. You, you flick it against the wall. You pick out a noodle, you flick it against the wall, and if it sticks, the spaghetti is done. So she goes, oh, okay, and she's got spaghetti boiling on the stove. Ten minutes later, I swear to God, this actually happened. Ten minutes later, we hear this whap, and then, oh, crap, and we walked in, and she had flung the entire pot of spaghetti and and that that's kind of the metaphor for how i solve some problems like it's like you walk in and you go there's ten thousand variables here there's moving parts there's systems within subsystems within subsystems you know what i'm just gonna fling the whole pot of spaghetti against the wall and whatever sticks we keep and whatever does it doesn't stick isn't ready to eat yet Turns out you have to be super explicit with those food testing instructions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what's next on your list of crazy things to figure out, Julia? Like I know you said TCP dump, which is intimidating currently. You ought to be about out of intimidating things, by the way. You know. This is not true. I think the next thing we'll see. Um the next thing I want to stop being intimidating is like all of statistics. <laughs> so which, which is pretty different from systems programming, I guess. But I did it, my undergrad in math, and then I forgot, I decided that statistics was dumb, and that <laughs> I wouldn't take statistics classes. <laughs> and when it turned out that that was, like, what I wanted to do all the time, that, I guess, was a mistake. So I wanted to learn, like, a lot of things about statistics. I have to agree with you there, that when I first started looking at, like, statistics... That math and the- is dumb? The, the, yeah, the, well, it's like you, you get into a statistics class and they start talking about chi squared and, you know, mm-hmm. R squared regression and you're like, this is dumb. Why? You know, and then you get into the real world and all of a sudden you need to go, you, you've, you've got, you know, 10 billion database samples and you mm-hmm. want to know if there's any correlation between, you know, this variable and that variable. And, oh, it turns out statistics can tell you that. And more importantly, if you knew statistics, you would know that, of course, X and Y are going to be correlated because Y is actually derived from X. And so believing that you have found a correlation between X and Y means you're stupid. And if you had, a, if you knew your statistics, you would know that that's a false positive that, you know, it's, you need to be looking at Z or, you know, you need to analyze the entire data set because it turns out that there's, there's W and Q and M and they're all interrelated in interesting and fascinating ways. And the math of statistics is dumb. 
but the questions of statistics are awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of math and statistics, like, <laughs> but the questions are amazing. Yeah, and like knowing when you can reasonably make a conclusion based on your data is really tough, and there are a lot of approaches to it. Like, it's weird. Like, I've done like more Bayesian statistics in the past, but like usually when you take a stats class, you learn frequentist statistics, which is like p-values. So I'm trying to actually learn like basic frequentist statistics now. And I'm like, oh, wow, this math is like, I can do it in two seconds. But like, remembering how to think about it the right way is hard. Because like, I'd be like, so the probability of the null pro- hypothesis, and my friend would be like, no, you're not no. allowed to say that. <laughs> 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 this is a frequent just blog post you're writing, Julia. Yes. <laughs> there are rules. Yes. Somebody asked, I, I made the claim a few weeks ago to a friend that this was a once in a lifetime thing. And he was like, can you prove that? And I said, well, disproving the null hypothesis requires that I die. So <laughs> this is why I have an anti-science agenda. Yeah. And like right now, there's like three statisticians listening to the podcast laughing their butts off. <sighs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Julie, you talked about how in part of learning statistics, you figured out the value of asking questions. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that a little bit? Because it was a great article. Oh, do you mean asking questions that sound dumb? Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is my favorite thing to do. This is how I learned everything. So I think this is actually what I learned at hacker school, which was not like anything about Rust, but actually how to ask questions. So if you ask a question that's really basic, like, for for example, like, what's a p-value? is a sort of embarrassing question to ask as someone with, like, a math degree, right? (laughs) Um, That's awesome. But you can still ask it if actually you don't know because you never took a statistics class. <laughs> or like, what what is the Linux kernel is an embarrassing question if like you've been using Linux for the last 10 years. <laughs> like, what does it do at all? Um, so what I'm hearing here is that asking stupid questions is a superpower. Yeah, well, asking smart questions is easy because if you ask a really smart question, then people think you're smart. Right. But if it turns out, I think that if you ask questions that are dumb, like, what is the Linux kernel? They very quickly lead to questions that are smart, because, like, you're like, what's the Linux kernel? Okay, what about this particular part? Like, what about scheduling? How does scheduling work? And then you're, you've are you got into, like, some specific detail about, like, the Linux kernel scheduling algorithm, which is definitely not a stupid question, because, like, who knows that? So I think that's one thing that I like. And then people start not knowing the answers, right? Like, you'll ask a question that seems dumb. And people will be like, oh, well, it's obviously this. And then you'll ask a follow-up question. They'll be like, oh, well, I think this, but I'm not sure. And then mm-hmm. you'll continue asking follow-up questions. And then you end up in the realm of, like, there's a research paper on that. Yeah. Even the question we dealt with earlier, what is a system call? I learned more about that, like, just maybe six months ago or something. And mm-hmm. it actually gets kind of mind-bending how far you go into that one question. Because, yeah. you know, your code runs in user space. And system calls live in kernel space. And those two are not allowed to interact. Mm -hmm. Right? So how exactly does that work? (laughs) Right? And the the answer is something like your code throws an abort or something, right? (laughs) That the kernel is watching for. Yeah. 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 And then it kicks in, takes over, and uh, it's it's crazy. It's really interesting to read about. Mm -hmm. I always think of it as, as something like you take an offering and you put the offering in like a dumb waiter. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and and you, you just you press you press the button and you don't know where the dumb waiter goes and you don't know where it comes back from but eventually it comes back and if you put the right offering in it comes back with the thing that you wanted. Oh my gosh! You just described DMA. That's amazing, <laughs> right? Direct <laughs> yep. memory access. You shovel yep. all the you and and the, the the thing that blew me away writing graphics drivers. We would do this, right? We'd shovel all these polygons down to the three D pipeline, and you make a a system call and you basically say. I want the offering plate and the kernel changes the voltage somewhere and literally switches control of a set of memory transistors, you know, in the RAM to be controlled by user space. And you can now set the bits in those little memory sticks. And then, yeah, you, you say send off the offering plate and it sends an interrupt down to, and by send an interrupt, what I mean is you put voltage on a wire. I mean, you're actually moving electrons now. I mean, this is no longer an intelligent, hyper fast computing device. This is a physical machine. Well, physical, I say physical, there, but there's, there's, there's particles moving. And the offering plate gets triggered and it flips the voltage on that DMA buffer at the top and says, user isn't controlling it anymore. Now kernel owns it. 
and the offering plate has been delivered, and it then sends it down the pipe. So cool. The, the cool part for me is to realize that this amounts to, especially on like on the older processors, like like the 386 or 40, or even the Pentiums, you could get out a, a diagram of the pins on the CPU, and you could actually figure out which pin was getting 5 volts or 3.3 volts applied to it in order to get the CPU's attention to tell it, hey, you need to switch this lever gate and go in this direction. So cool. And does that knowledge ever turn out useful, or is it just fun for scaring people at parties? I don't know. Can't it be both? It's <laughs> a good point. One thing that surprised me is that, like, I learned about operating system programming for, like, six weeks, and I wrote all these blog posts, and then I got an email from someone being like, would you like to interview for this, like, kernel developer job? And I was like, is that a joke? Like, have you been reading my blog post? I just learned to turn the screen blue, okay? <laughs> yep, yeah, you're now two orders of magnitude above everybody else in that space. <laughs> exactly, right? How many people yeah. know how to do that? So I ended up interviewing to work on, like, the iOS kernel, wow. which was sort of hilarious. And I didn't think that that would have been a thing. <laughs> so yes, it's like, it's if you it. ask questions that are really dumb, then eventually you actually know things. Right, that's exactly right. So, Julia, have, have you read So Good They Can't Ignore You, or are you just the accidental poster child for it? I don't know what that is. It's a book that I think Katrina or James picked on the show. It's Katrina. Uh, Katrina picked on the show six or seven months ago, and it basically talks about the concept of career capital, and basically you invest in yourself, and this builds up the amount of capital you have in your own career. And you are describing to a T how to invest in yourself and then have it pay off at a much higher rate and a much higher, uh, a much sooner rate of return, you know, date of return than you ever thought possible, right? I mean, you wrote mm -hmm. a couple of, you, you you hacked on some stuff, you wrote a couple of blog posts, and the next thing you know, you're working on it full time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, one thing that was kind of hard is I realized that I didn't actually want to work on it full time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was like, this is really fun. However, I'm going to go do machine learning now. Yeah. But I was like, I could. Like, it was like really surprising. <laughs> Like, if I worked more, I could actually get a job doing this, and this, like, could be my life. You That's can... actually a good thing, though, that you learned enough to know, eh, not that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, get um, enough of a taste of it to know that it tastes bad. <laughs> or at least not right now. Yeah, there are spaces that you get into that you're like, okay, the science is interesting, the programming is cool, the engineering is awesome, and all the people that are doing it are jerks. Mm. I'm yeah. just going to keep this as a hobby and I'll come back in 10 years and see if these guys are a little more enlightened. This is what's scariest about the Linux kernel to me. Like there are a lot of really amazing people who work on it and there's the Gnome Outreach Program for Women, which is like this Linux kernel internship that you can do if you're a woman. And I think all the people who work on that are really are, are like wonderful and supportive and are like beginners. We can have beginners and then they can learn things and then they will no longer be beginners. <laughs> And they'll, like, mentor you and not yell at you. But I think the community as a whole seems kind of scary. The, it, and it, it depends on the type of community, right? I mean, like, like, it used to be a running joke that the, the Gen 2 Linux crowd were very hostile to newcomers. So much so that the, the joke arose that it's that people would say it's really easy to get tech support in Gen 2. You just go into their IRC channel and scream, Gen 2 is a piece of crap. It can't even drive a brother XL4E laser printer. And you will immediately get six people who will go, yes, it can. You just, and then you will get six answers on how to. It's amazing. Right? But if you go in there and go, hey, I've got this brother printer. How do I get it? You'll get, you know, well, why don't you learn how to program? Right? And okay, that was 10 years ago that that joke was, was relevant. I don't know if it still is anymore. But like you talked earlier about the Rust community, you went into the IRC mm -hmm. channel and you asked what you thought was a stupid question. I don't understand strings. And then you asked the same stupid question, right? Which is usually career death, right? If you ask the same <laughs> question twice, but, but you weren't asking the same question, right? You were saying, okay, I've listened to what you've said. I've learned a bunch and I still don't get it. And these people were probably coming back and saying, it's okay. We changed the way strings work. <laughs> so, yeah. maybe, you know, it's not your fault. The language is changing. And, and, you know, God bless those people for sitting down with a, you know, a, a new programmer and saying this programming language is a table saw with all the guards and safeties taken off. It wants to take your thumb off. 
And we're going to take a new programmer and we're going to try and walk you through this. We're going to try, you know, basically where we want Rust to be in a year or two is usable by everybody. And what better way to do that than to take this person who's going, I still don't get strings and make it so that she does get strings. That's a victory for Rust and for you and for the people in that. And that that's a very different community than like a tired, curmudgeonly, user hostile you know, or newbie hostile community. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the Rust community is very explicit about this. Like the Rust community has a code of conduct that says like, you're not allowed to be a jerk. (laughs) That's cool. I'm switching languages. (laughs) Chuck, can we start a Rust Rogues podcast? (laughs) It still works. Rust Rogues. Yeah, you can Uh, post it. Never mind. (laughs) (laughs) When M17N was added to um, Ruby, and then shortly after that, they came to me and said, can you replace CSV with faster CSV? Which meant I had to rewrite the inner guts of faster CSV to be aware of M17N. And um, I asked, I'm sure everyone on the core team was ready to just ban me by the end of that week because I, you know, I can't believe how many stupid questions I asked. You know, What's this do? What's this do? What's this do? What's this do? And most of the time they had pretty good answers, you know, and that worked out to their benefit because then I was one of the few people in the world that almost kind of understood what M17N did. So I turned around and wrote it all down on my blog so other people might figure it out someday. So that that helped, one. And then two, I did actually find, like, legitimate edge cases that they hadn't thought of. You know, it's like, well, what do I do when I'm here? And they're like, oh, hang on, you know, new commit to Ruby. Try this now. Okay, thanks. This thing that you mentioned about going to the Gentoo IRC channel and saying that your brother printer doesn't work, I think, like, I kind of do this at work sometimes, is, like, I won't have documentation for something, and I'll want documentation. So what I'll do is I'll, like, write down the documentation to the best of my knowledge, and then nice. put it up somewhere in public and be like, is this right? And people will be like, no! <laughs> <laughs> and then go fix it. That's awesome. I wrote this. It's probably terribly wrong. If you would like other people to see the right thing, you could correct it. This and then use it next by Google right quick. now. And then everyone is happy. That's a brilliant twist on a creative hack that I will use where I will ask people for ideas, you know, creative ideas. And everyone's like, well, I don't have any idea. So I will start throwing out bad ideas, like like deliberately horrible ideas. And you'd be surprised how people, how quickly people come up with good ideas when they want to get away from one of my bad ideas. Yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite. That's awesome. You want to evoke like this, like, no! Yeah, yeah exactly. Response exactly. in people. Yep. Uh, Nothing like doing it wrong to make others want to do it right, right? Yes. <laughs> but, but this is something you can, like, hack with yourself, too. Like, sometimes when I write something, I'll be like, I'll just write something terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I'll write a terrible blog post, and maybe then I'll be able to fix it after. Great point. Or write the terrible blog post and wait for all the commenters to show up and tell you how to do it better. Yeah, which is scary. Like, it's scary to publish things that you think are bad. Right, because yeah. commenters, internet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a good comment policy, which is that I moderate all my comments. Yep. So nothing bad can happen. Yep. That's the best policy, yeah. Well, Julia, that was awesome. Your Our stroll through your blog was, was <laughs> a week well spent, in my yes. case. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. This was really fun. Absolutely. Yep. All right, should we get to the picks? Let's do it. All right. David, do you want to start with the picks? So I said during the show that I didn't have any picks, and during the show, one came to me really quickly, so I'm going to do this in like 15 seconds. Candice Pacheco is a mu- musician, and she was fiddling around with programming her MIDI controller in fourth, and one day she accidentally played the source code into the MIDI controller, and it came out sounding bizarre and strange and musical, and she liked it. And she went on to build an entire album based on some of the sounds and noises that her MIDI controller made when she fed it source code instead of the actual compiled code. So the album is called If Then Else. It's kind of world music mashed up with techno and electronica, and I kind of like it. So that's my picks. Dave, have you ever heard Meatloaf's song 45 Seconds of Ecstasy? No, I have not. I think you need to check that one out. But most okay. importantly, you need to look at the runtime on it. Okay. My source code plays the Mario theme when you put it through MIDI. <laughs> Mario. 
<laughs> there was actually a, I don't think it works anymore, or maybe it's been fixed. I can't remember. I know I checked it at one point and it was broken, but there used to be a command a gem, Ruby Gems plugin called Gem Sing, and then you could, S I N G, and then you could give it the name of a gem and it would sing the source code, quote unquote, by it basically like every time there was a, a new scope started, like a class or a method or something, and then every time it hit an end, it had these different MIDI sounds. And so different code had like different rhythm. It was kind of interesting. Awesome. I see it in uh, rubygems.org, but uh, the homepage is, uh, what is it, RubyForge. And so it's not there anymore because RubyForge is gone. All right, James, All right, what I'll are you believe, I'll believe RubyForge is gone when I stop getting spam from them. <laughs> All right, James, what are your picks? Okay, here's a couple. I was involved in a kind of fun discussion on Parlay this week about service objects and rails and kind of moving things out of controllers. And somebody brought this article to my attention, Gourmet Service Objects. And I really like it. I read about 10 million of these kind of articles. And I'm sure... Probably most of us by now are aware of all the problems of adding another layer of objects and stuff. Uh, but this one seemed really practical. Like, you know, it didn't, it didn't try to do a bunch of things like now you gotta handle flash messages and redirects and all of that inside these objects and, and crazy stuff that I see people doing all the time. And, uh, it was really straightforward. And simple. I, I don't think this is the kind of thing you want to do everywhere, but when you do, I think you want to be aiming towards something way closer to this. So I'll throw this out there just because I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the other one is this question on Quora that I saw that was, uh, what are some lifestyle changes that save money? And, uh, this is one of those great questions because I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty good with money. I know all that. And then I went and read the first answer and was like, wow, never thought of that. Wow, never thought of that. Wow, never thought of that. So, yeah, lots of really great, ridiculously practical uh, advice on the on the very first answer to this question. So I, I think it's worth checking out, uh, even if you think you're good at this kind of thing. Those are my picks. Someday you're going to be so rich, you're going to be paying our listeners to listen. <laughs> yeah, wait for it. <laughs> Avdi, what are your picks? Oh, I got a few. Let's see. I've been uh, pushing up some more apps these days, and with apps comes the need to monitor them and make sure that they're not falling over and dying too often. And uh, I've been using Honey Badger to monitor the errors coming out of my apps. Not that errors would ever come out of my apps, but, you know, on the off chance that one might. I've been using Honey Badger, and uh, I like it a lot. I mean, it's there are a lot of apps in this space for monitoring errors and reporting them, and I can't say that Honey Badger is the very best because I haven't tried all of them. But uh, it's got a nice UI. It's got nice inter- integrations with other things. feels very snappy, and uh, all in all, it's been working pretty well. Oh, and it works well with my non-Rails, just like pure Sinatra, Rack and Sinatra apps that I tend to put up. So yeah, Honey Badger. Uh, another thing that I've been using is Paper Trail. The other day, I, I pushed up an app that I wrote in, like, a caffeine-fueled 12-hour frenzy and had no tests, and uh, it was very small, uh, did one thing. And part of my peace of mind in pushing it up without any tests was that I made sure it did copious logging, and then I made sure the logs dumped into Paper Trail. And Paper Trail just, all it does is it, it gives you a place to dump all your logs, and it makes them very easy, very easy and fast to search, and you can set up notifications if, like, certain events happen or if too many events happen in a short period of time or something like that. So it gave me just enough peace of mind that I, would be, I could be like, okay, if something breaks, I'll at least see what happened in the logs and I'll be able to fix it. Here's a gem that I use all the time and it's one of those things that's so basic that it would only be seem weird if it didn't exist. But the fact is there was a long time where it, when it didn't exist. And that gem is Tilt. Tilt is like this sort of intermediary between programs and all of the many, many templating languages that exist in the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, so whether it's Markdown or SAS or ERB or Haml or Slim or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Tilt knows how to take a file in one format and then expand it using whichever, whatever appropriate templating language gem into a different format. And yeah, one of those things that like, of course it has to exist, except there was a time when it didn't and things sucked more than they do now. So Tilt is cool. 
I will also pick deadlines. I know that Douglas Adams famously said that he liked the whooshing sound as they go flying past. <laughs> uh, and that's a nice bonus. But, uh, you know, I, I don't have as many deadlines as I used to. I sort of deliberately structured my life to not have as many deadlines as I used, used to. And mostly that's a good thing. But I have to say, every now and then when I do set myself a deadline, it's remarkable how much I get done. You know, on projects that I've been leave, leaving slide for months and months, it's surprising how much I can get done. Uh, when I do set a deadline. So so I, I will pick occasionally setting de- deadlines because it seems to, to work out well. Uh, I wasn't going to pick anything else, but here's one that's topical for the episode. We we're talking about tools that let you spy on things and let you see what's really going on. And one that I used just like yesterday to do that is Man in the Middle Proxy, MITM Proxy. And basically it sits in between web clients, HTTP clients, and HTTP servers and it tells you everything that's going on between them, and it it form, lays it out in a nice nice UI where you can dig into the requests and see what's really going on in there, and uh, figure out why uh, the JavaScript on on that page isn't loading or whatever. Um, I'm drooling over here. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a it's a really neat tool, and I've just started to dig into it. I mean, it'll it'll hex dump the actual like data that went over the wire and everything. Um, you might look at it and think, okay, well that's what Wireshark does, but it's it's a bit more specialized for HTTP than Wireshark is. And so it gives you nice abilities to do things like replay HTTP requests without actually forcing the app to redo the request or edit the headers for a request and then replay it. So it's like a, a, a little bit higher level than than Wireshark would be and lets you do some more HTTP-specific stuff. Okay, I'm finally done. Awesome. I'm going to pick a productivity tool that I've been uh, trying out for a while. It's called Redbooth. I might have picked it in the past. It also has a, a Gmail plugin that for Chrome. So I've been using that. And what that does is it allows me to add email or email threads to Red Booth and create a task. And then I, when I get up in the morning, I just uh, go through and look at the pending tasks. I usually start with the urgent ones and then the not urgent ones and, you know, move a few into here's what I'm going to get done today. And uh, it's it's really nice. I'm really liking it. it. I guess it used to be called Teambox. So if you're familiar with that, then uh, it's the same thing. But anyway, super duper handy. And I'm just really digging that. I also, I hadn't been feeling well for a few weeks. And, uh, you know, it would, it was off and on with different bowel related problems and stomach related problems and things like that. And I actually, I have a brother and a sister that both have issues with eating wheat. And so I decided to go off of wheat. And so I've been off wheat for about a week and I've been feeling better. I'm not completely sure if it's because I'm off wheat or because since I'm off wheat, I'm not eating other things or not eating out as often. And it's kind of hard, but at the same time, I've been feeling a lot better. So I'm just going to throw that out there and say, give it a shot. And there's a book out there that explains some of the science behind it that I picked up after I went off wheat. And uh, it also gives you pointers on how to eat wheat free. It's called Wheat Belly. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But anyway, I thought I'd throw that out there. So if if you're having health problems of one type or another, you may want to just try this. Julia, what are your picks? A few months ago, I read this article about how to become a senior engineer, which really like amazed me because you might like, I was like, oh, I'm going to read about like how to code better and become better at typing on my computer. And then it was like, like mentor people and be kind to people and help other people become better, and be egoless about your code, and try to, like, become detached from it. And it was, like, all of these, like, things that I think about a lot, (laughs) but didn't think of, like, being part of, like, maturing as a programmer. And that's this post by John Alspa from Etsy. Another thing about S-Trace is that Brendan Gregg has this fantastic site about tools like Perf, um, where he like explains how to use them and what they can do and gives examples. And he has a tool for generating like beautiful flame graphs about your code. And my last pick is like what I talk about all the time, which is hacker school. And you can always apply to hacker school if you want to become a better programmer for 12 weeks. Applications are always open. In particular, they're open today. That's all. Yeah, definitely yeah, go check it out. Uh, it's hackerschool.com, isn't it? It is hackerschool.com. Well, thanks for coming, Julia. Before yeah. we wrap up i just want to remind everybody we are doing our book club book and we're going to be talking about refactoring ruby edition so uh go pick up the book start reading it there's great stuff in there and yeah we'll wrap up the show we'll catch you all next week a special thanks to honeybadger.io for sponsoring ruby rogues they do exception monitoring uptime and performance metrics and are an active part of the ruby community hosting and bandwidth provided by the blue box group check them out at bluebox.net 
Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join the conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor. 